We are so pleased to welcome our special guest and featured founder today, Allison Faulkner, and our very own Brie Ray PR and communication specialist will be introducing you to her today. So let's welcome them both with a huge round of applause. It's That's great. about it's it, great. right? Hi. Yes. Yeah. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. You guys are doing such a good job. Well, I didn't do anything yet, but no, thank like you. They did the amazing. The whole event. Yes. <laughs> AJ, just live my life for me. Like, I'm yours. <laughs> do my website. Did not every single person feel that way? Absolutely. That was, I mean, they might not say it how I say it, but. But they felt it. Yeah, they, they felt, felt it. it. They yes. felt it, AJ. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to brag about you for just a second. Oh, just gosh. so people understand who we have on the stage with us. So Allison Faulkner of The Allison Show has made a career of doing whatever she feels like doing. But it always involves finding ways to feel awesome and help others feel awesome, too. Allison is a branding and events expert with a highly engaged online community. She hosts an iTunes Top 100 podcast with her music producer, Hubby, called Awesome with Allison, which I was listening to this morning, and it is awesome. Thank you. Yes. And she also founded Allison's Brand School, which has helped thousands through workshops and online courses that empower entrepreneurs with heart to build a brand that can support their dreams. She collaborates and consults with Fortune 500 companies and believes in love, dancing inappropriately, and putting your own name in light. So give a warm welcome oh, to <laughs> <laughs> Allison. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so oh. much. We oh, did you? Yeah. We have to stay hydrated, and I know. Oh, that's my girl. There we go. Thanks, Kevin. There Thanks, we Rev go. Road. <laughs> <laughs> so, you guys, if you are not aware yet, I'm sure you are familiar with So Delicious <laughs> and all of the glory that they are. And so much of that I personally attribute to you because you worked so much with them on branding and on growth and all the things. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey with So Delicious and what you took them through? Did you know this was going to happen? Okay, so <laughs> Kevin Arnig from So Delicious is actually here. And how, so like, let's give it up for Kevin for keeping us all caffeinated. <gasps> this is so fun. <laughs> I love that we went here. This is, this is great. Because I'm so, I'm so happy Completely you're here, Kevin. Unplanned. This is so great. <laughs> so I, of course, would never take credit for the incredibly <laughs> successful brand and business. That is So Delicious. They did that all on their own. But very fortunate. Fortunately for me, I had the opportunity to meet Kevin right when they opened. And Kevin is, and so delicious, they're a perfect example of a strong brand. And my real core belief with branding is that a real strong brand stems from core characteristics from one of the main founders, period. Um, and so Rev Road has a really strong brand. I met Darren, and I'm like, yep. I get it. And it was the same thing with Kevin. I met Kevin. He has these awesome characteristics. He's done the work to infuse them and scale them like crazy because So Delicious has how many franchises? or Not franchises, stores. They're not franchises. 23. So they have 23 bricks and mortars locations. And that is, that is some branding, right? So how I got lucky enough to get started in all of the branding is I felt called to do it. I would go to conferences, I would go to big blogging things, and people wanted to talk, and I was like, let's talk about this. Tell me about your dreams. Tell me about your purpose. How are we going to infuse it? That, and it was a real pain point for me that I don't know if anybody is picking up, but, like, I have a personality of sorts. Like, just kind a, of. Just a titch, and it's really easy for me to have a personality. It was very difficult for me to separate my business from my person. So I find businesses always have one of two problems. Either they over-identify, put themselves too much in it, or they, they like, karate chop hack. No, it's, I'm not putting myself in my business. You're crazy, poppy blonde girl, right? <laughs> we can talk about your problems later. Engagement, wink. And so I loved So Delicious because I loved Kevin, and I invited him to come to my very first Build an Awesome Brand workshop that I did in my office. And I said, so I had been doing these big dance parties. I would sell out 900 tickets in five minutes. And I did not get how good I had it. I did not know. Um, and it's ruined me ever since. But 
They were very successful dance parties. I worked with So Delicious on them. And then I didn't want to do it anymore. So I stopped. And everyone was really mad about that. And I was like, no, I'm going to teach a brand workshop. So I went from literally popping out of a birthday cake that I had commissioned, a life-size birthday cake, with dancing sharks behind me, Whoa. with my own theme song. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, somebody's impressed. <laughs> no, with my, uh, like, my husband made me a theme song. Okay, I went from that to saying, come give your, me your money. I'm going to talk to you about business. Take me seriously. And Kevin, of course, was not only one of the first people to say, yes, Allison, I want to hear what you have to talk about, but he was a contributor at my first event, and he came and he shared a little bit about branding. And then when I was deciding, how, like, how do I want to continue this? Do I want to consult? Do I just do this workshop? I worked with So Delicious as my first branding client, one-on-one -on -one with him and his amazing wife, Annie, and figured out how I write a brand deck, figured out how all these ideas, all of these theories I had about building my own brand, how I could teach them to other people, how could I help other people who are nothing like me also implement all of these principles? Does it even work? So kind of a special thing that we were able to do that. And, yes. and Kevin and Annie, um, I, I don't know if you still do it, but used a lot of the brand deck, a lot of what we created, and they used that most specifically in training and in each of the 23 locations. So uh, kind of, you know, tying it all together, how do you, like, that's my definition of a brand is the personification of a business. So it has a way it talks, a way it walks, a way that it welcomes you. Rev Road, incredible brand. You guys came to my office to do a little video footage. I was making inappropriate jokes so fast. I felt so comfortable. <laughs> I didn't, I, like, I, did, I was like, why am I being so comfortable? And it's, <laughs> because you guys make entrepreneurs feel comfortable and confident. I was like, AJ, take me, I'm yours, do my website, like live, like immediately. That's a beautiful, strong brand. Thank you. And I'm so excited to get to meet the reason why it's a strong brand, because it's real. It wasn't decided in a box by a committee. Real, you can't create realness from artificiality. And so these brands that are, I mean, even if you think about Amazon, side tangent, do you want to ask me other questions? Go on a okay. side tangent. So even if you take it, take it. <laughs> if we want to dance that way. So <laughs> even if you think about like Amazon, which is like huge, and you're like, does, I really want to know, do you guys feel like, and maybe even before a year or two ago, Amazon has a really strong brand? No, I, my personal, and there's a lot of really smart people in the room, right? So like I, I'm, I'll hear it all, but I say no. Because if anybody else can get me my stuff that I want at the price that I want as fast, if not faster, than Amazon, see you later, suckers. Right? That's, that's how I personally feel. Whereas I keep buying my, my Air Mac, my iPods, my iPhone that breaks and is so annoying, like a zombie, like a mindless zombie to the Apple store every time there's an update. The lines around... And that's, you, you talk about these big, iconic brands, Apple, Nike. Now, d did any of you go to Silicon Slopes and get to hear old Zucks speak? Mm -hmm. He was amazing. You know, we're on a, we're on, that's a nickname we have together old when we Zucks. hang out, me and Zucks. Um, <laughs> and he, I feel like Facebook and Amazon, now that they're under all this fire, now that people are demanding realness from them, and when you heard Zuckerberg talk about Facebook, he was just like the tech, figure it out, get it out there. And then, oh, social responsibility. Oh, we created a platform where the KKK can get together. And I mean, and they're having terrorist organizations. What, what do we believe as a company? And for him, it was always kind of like pull back. And now I feel like Facebook and Amazon, these big, big companies are developing brands. I don't know, these are just ideas I have. We can talk about them. But, I, yeah. I enjoy it. Okay. I enjoy it. Yes. So what you're saying then is taking some core values of said founder yeah. and implementing it into and a And people brand. get really sticky here. And I get, here's the thing. At the end of the day, what do you want? Con well, you want connection. That's what you want, Chari. And so you created Persnickety Prince, which helps people connect. Yeah? Did I make all this up? No, I know these things. And, and so... But, you know, I could have, you could have just as easily said if you were me, 
uh, you know, if you want to go into the core human needs, I want significance. I want to know that I matter. So I want these memories. I want these photos so that my family, we matter. Our stories matters. It's, it just depends on, on the human nature. And so with businesses, with brands, it depends what you want. Do you want, so what I focus on in Allison's Brand School is, do you want to be emotionally and spiritually, do you want to be fulfilled by the work you do? If you want to be fulfilled, it's going to require some of these things I talk about. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world if what fulfills you isn't just your day job. Mm. Like, we are so obsessed with that and, and really, like, entrepreneurs, they're so great. Like, follow your passion. How many of us know exactly what it feels like to follow our passion? Yes? Like, yes? I literally only do exactly what I want to do, and I still cry under my desk. <laughs> you, like, <laughs> like, I'm glad I'm not the only yeah, one. Yeah, no. This, it's like one of my It just it invites me sometimes, or it's like, it's so <laughs> safe under there. So I think the question really is, what do you want to do? What are you fueled by? What are you, like, full with? What is your purpose? Mm. And for me, the work I do is very closely related to my purpose. I personally believe that um, we're going to heal the world. We're going to do more good in this world if we are emotionally, passionately, not dangerously overconnected or over-identifying with, but we are impassioned um, by the work we create because it holds us to a higher standard because mm. we really care. So, yes, that's what I'm about. Depends what you want. Do I still have great principles if you don't want to be as feely-dilly, hippy-dippy? Absolutely. <laughs> They're going to work, too. Okay, so when building out this brand, what would you say are the first five steps a company should sit down and think about as they go about creating this brand? So I don't know if I would even say five steps, right? Mm -hmm. I think... The, the reason why I feel so confident and comfortable talking about brand, even with people who, like, on paper would look way more successful than me, is because I'm really good at it. Um, because, <laughs> because I thank you so much. But I, I had to do it. I couldn't decide what I wanted to do. I don't like to ride one horse. I'm not going to decide exactly what I want to do. I wanted to talk about you know, why do I feel like crap? I wanted to do arts and crafts. I wanted to do baking. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do parties, events. I wanted to do all these different things. And I wanted to be able to change my mind. And so I created a brand. Because a brand is independent of business model, really, or, or even product. So I just naturally did that and then walked around being like, oh, wait, oh, how do I make money? Oh my gosh, you need money. Dang it. And now it's, I kept saying I built a business backwards, but it's so interesting because now there's two ways to, there's always been a million ways to build a business, but especially if you talk to somebody under the age of 25, they believe they need to build a platform first. Yes? Like, I need a huge YouTube following, or I need a TikTok following, I need an Instagram following before I can do my product. And I was like, I my dad, who's an entrepreneur, kept being like, what's your product? What are you selling? What are you creating? And I'm like, if you build it, they will come. I just fields have dreamed it, like, for a decade. And they did. And then I realized, okay, that's actually just uh, one way to build a business, right? So back to your original question. Allison, I want a stronger brand. Well, then you get to do the inner work. <laughs> that, that why work. Um, I love human needs psychology. That's what I teach at my branding workshop mm. is a lot of human needs psychology, identifying, you know, what drives you. Everybody has a different need that sits in the passenger seat with them. I, the Allison show of Allison's Brand School with the Awesome with Allison podcast with her Allison show So Delicious drink and maybe a little driven by identity and significance. I don't know if anyone picked up on that, <laughs> right? Like... <laughs> And so I have a podcast where at the end of every podcast, I say, only you can be you, and you're already as awesome as you need to be. Because I freaking love hearing it. And then you meet me in person, and it's an authentic experience. And my engagement is good. And when I throw an in-person event, I can actually get people to come. If we want to talk about why even bother with a brand, your seats aren't empty. That's why you bother, bother with a brand. You know, Rev Road, even internally, is like, we will fill these seats. 
the engagement, the connection, that we are people who believe this, so we do things like this. And your service can completely change because maybe there's a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Right? Yeah. And the brand holds true. So step number one, you maybe start examining that why. What do you connect to? What do you care about? And it always starts with what's, what do you need to hear at the end of the day? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't need to hear that they did a good job. They need to hear they're respected. They need to hear they matter. I really like if you tell me I did a good job, by the way. Like, I, um, other people, they don't need to hear. That's stupid. Why would I need to hear that I'm doing a good job? Obviously, it doesn't even matter. But I need to know that the people in my life, they are there for me. It's, it's just whatever you're driven by. So if you want to get a little more excited about what you do, think about what you care about, and then how can you infuse it? Can we share that one slide I have? I have yeah. one slide. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like my one slide. This is my TED Talk slide. It should be. So you've got the core creator. We take pieces of that creator. Their driving needs, their fun quirks, their bomb.com language. That's me, bomb.com. Seth, do you say bomb.com? <laughs> <laughs> he says not anymore. <laughs> not since 1998. Um, but I want your logo, by the way. That was the best thing I've ever seen. Okay. And we take that and we put it into the awesome brand. So I am not my brand. I'm just, there's pieces of me in the brand. That's why it's an authentic experience because it came from something real. So the gentleman over here, when he asked this question, do you start with this? Do you start with that? Do you start with that? That is much like Frankensteining to me personally a brand. I believe that it should come from this real solid place. And then it doesn't have to, oh, here's all my wounds. Here's all my childhood needs on display. No. <laughs> we don't walk around with like our deepest need tattooed on us. Well, actually some people do, but we put it in the brand. How do you deliver? I'm sorry, I did my stand up thing. You can stand, um, you stand, stand. <laughs> you tell, I miss teaching at my <laughs> workshops. Okay, so you take pieces of that freaking awesome brand and then how do you deliver them to people? Brand promises, product, messaging, robots on Facebook, robot messengers that use the language of your brand. Mm. So I use the word freaking a lot. Recently, a company wanted me to do a training <laughs> and they asked me not to use air hump. And I said, <laughs> well, <laughs> you shouldn't have hired me. <laughs> Cause I mean, it's pretty mild, but like that's their prerogative and that's mm. my prerogative. And I'm not mad, and they're not mad, and then I attract people who are okay with things like that, and then sometimes I accidentally get hired to speak at a dental convention, <laughs> and we just see what happens there. <laughs> like, that actually happened. <laughs> and I had the head of the entire dental organization on the stage doing the happy clam dance move, <laughs> and that's just what's gonna happen. So, then, it sometimes works out. Sometimes I'm at the dentist organization, and then sometimes I'm speaking to Pinterest. Mm. And the Ben from Pinterest, the CEO, he's doing the happy clam, and he loves the happy clam. He didn't love the happy clam, but he was a good sport about it. <laughs> and so you find those raving fans with similar values. An authentic brand is one that accurately reflects key personality traits and the driving needs of one of, or sometimes a combination. For So Delicious, it was a combination of Kevin and Annie. Um, the core founders or visionaries. And if you look at Nike, if you look at Apple, it's fun because there's so many bioptics and things you can watch about those brands. It's Bill Bowerman through and through. Mm. Like, and it's, it's awesome and it's exciting. I get excited. Sorry, what other questions do you have? This is incredible. What's so, okay, you so instead of, of instead of five steps, instead of five steps to stay on topic, this is my answer. Okay. This is my answer. So we start with you. Or maybe you meet with the people in your company. You start with you. What are some pieces that you want to share? What are some beliefs, some driving needs? What is some language? So the way I love to think of it, again, a brand, personification, a person. If your brand walks in the room, does it hug? Does it like awkwardly stroke the person's arm and play with their hair and say, oh my gosh, you're so pretty? Yeah. Maybe it just like lots of self-respect, lots of love and dignity. Good to see you, good to see you, right? Like, if, if that's how you are as a human being, 
And you can infuse that into your website design, into your email exchanges, into your Instagram captions, into every little touch point. So I do a big tree analogy and that why is the roots of the tree and you don't put the roots up above the ground and on display, that's that why that connects to you, that gives you a uh feeling. And then all of those little touch points are the leaves. And that's where you get the good user design and the interface and what, like, just like the leaf of a tree, somebody's gonna walk up. But what happens is people usually just wanna talk about the leaves. And if you just wanna talk about the leaves, that's actually fine, I'm just not your girl. Cause I'm gonna, <laughs> cause I'm always gonna take it deeper because I had a very, very, very successful, wildly television show offers everything I ever dreamed of being offered to me. And I felt I was having too many anxiety attacks and, and just too much suffering to enjoy or really want any of it anymore. So I created this, I internalized this, I taught this, it brought others relief, it brought others joy, and then it helped me create a healthier business rather than just trying to personify and be everything and have it mean too much about me. And so I was able to scale. So I had the Allison show, and then I've been able to, to do a lot with Allison's brand school. It's, I don't know. We'll see what this year, how it goes. I'm not sure what's happening. But usually <laughs> it's the primary income. It's the primary income for my business. Um, I monetize with a lot of different revenues. Mm. But so I would say if you want to get started on a brand, just go back and ask yourself, have I been trying to do branding by committee and by what everybody else wants? Because if you have been, that's why you're not getting any engagement. Just like it's such a simple, easy fix. It's, uh, this might be a really inappropriate or bad, I don't know if it's mean, it's the desperate girl in high school who's, I will be this for this person, let's say the desperate guy in high school. I will be this for this person, I will be that for that person, I will be that for that person. Mm -hmm. You never really trust them. You don't know what they stand for. And um, yeah, when you, when you start with some core truths for you, and then of course, just like that Venn diagram that you shared in the website design, you take what your fans love, what you love, what is in your zone of genius, what you were put on this earth to do, you get that beautiful sweet spot in the center, and life is really good. I really like my life. I feel really, <laughs> <laughs> I just want that good, for everyone. As you should. Yeah. As you, said, as you should. So let's talk a little bit about working with a team. And you mentioned creating a brand by committee versus yeah. kind of just deciding on personal, this is personal values, building your brand from there, right? So as far as working with a team on branding, how would you suggest going about that? And how would you suggest responding to and um, taking in feedback and suggestions? So I think first, if you're working with a team, and I've worked with a lot, of, a lot of large companies, both in positive, this is going really well situations, and in, I don't think this is gonna work for us situations. So, right, like, yeah. um, it's, brand is a, is a reflection of organizational health. So when you talk about teams, it's almost hard for me to separate brand and organizational health and working with a team and, then you take organizational health and it's a pretty clear parallel to mental and, and self-health. So like your, the wellness of yourself. And so when, the, the Advantage, anybody else love that? It's a, gr it's a great book all about organizational health. It's an awesome book. And it just talks about how businesses, their problems, the problem of the core creator and founder, the CEO, the person in charge, they're always magnified throughout the business. Mm -hmm. So for example, one of my problems is I have to always be working or I'm basically worthless. I don't do this anymore. This was when all the anxiety attacks happen. If I'm not working, <laughs> what am I even bothering doing? Um, other people probably can't do it as good as I do it. And basically kind of frantic. So that was everything we did. Every person I attracted, every person on my team. So to answer your question, if you're working with a team and you're the core visionary, maybe you're not the founder, maybe you're just the visionary. That works too for your brand. Get away from everyone. Mm. Get away from everyone. I, big companies, big brands, they have that visionary that drives and steers them. 
My sister um, has an awesome large company called Tubby Todd. It's all nat natural bath products. And she is the visionary. But she gets bogged down in the CEO role. And her husband works there. And my dad is on the board. I do not want to do that. But that she's a, she's a connection-driven human being. So she does a business with a bunch of family connection. And so for her, when it comes down to, to push Tubby Todd forward, the next frontier, she's got to go away. It's just like meditation and self-care, where you go in first. So that's what I would say. So then I show up at the meeting for this branding meeting, and I'm maybe the visionary or the core person. I show up. I feel secure. I know kind of the direction I want to go. I'm not feeling defensive, so I don't get so stuck on one idea that I can't hear other people's ideas. I'm secure in myself, so I'm also not defensive. I haven't thought about this before, but I really like it. It really is, <laughs> it really is organizational health. It, it, is a t it is a top stem down, right? If you're, if you're healthy up here, and then it's going to get reflected in your branding going to get reflected in your branding. And the companies, some of the companies and people that I've worked with who have a really, really awesome founder who is really good at seeing other people's expertise and assembling a team, they, but have a hard time standing up and being loud in their own voice, they have a hard time with brand too. Because the strongest voice in the room takes the brand where, they, where it wants to go. So if they bring in an outside marketing company, the strongest voice at that outside marketing company is going to take the brand where it, wanna go, where it wants to go. So it's just like work on being like a centered human, and you can have a centered brand. It's perfect. OK, so we'll have some meditation yeah, as we, well after We can this. do it right now yes, if you want. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> OK, so you also mentioned some monetization. And I feel like a lot of time as entrepreneurs, maybe this is my own personal issue, is we build up a brand and then are completely stuck on how to monetize it or um, different ways to monetize it if one way is not working. What is your advice in that? So I want to be mindful of time. I feel like I've talked a lot. You're good. We're good. We're cruising. OK. Yeah, you're doing great. You let me know. Oh, it's right there. OK, you yeah. cut, cut me off whenever. <laughs> you're doing great. So. Darren and I were talking about how much we love business models, which is like, I don't know how many people I've been able to say, I love talking about business models. And they're like, yeah, they're so exciting. Um, and the reason I love business models is they're like different personalities. So you have a certain type of personality with a certain skill set. That's going to work well for a certain type of product in exchange. A business model, monetization, right? I like teaching and talking. This fills me up. I do not feel drained. I'm having a lot of fun. This also took work. I have my, you know, like work to feel good and the 10,000 hours and all of that. So now I have shifted all of my monetization around this. So I talk and Julie with the purple hair over there listens and can create a five page outline. Mm. It took me a decade to find Julie, don't touch her. <laughs> <laughs> right? So monetization. I say, what is your zone of genius mm. where you create, where you feel charged, um, filled up, and not drained? I've spent a lot of time thinking that I really need to figure out my sales funnels. Mm. That was a sad year. Like a very sad, sad year. I don't want to figure out my sales funnels. Anyone who would like to figure them out, just, I'm really easy to find online, OK? I've had people try. I focus on monetizing in my zone of genius what charges me, what fuels me, what I feel like expands and challenges me. Now, if that is a too out there answer and you want a more cre concrete answer, how are you going to know what drains you versus what charges you? You have to try things. So I've sold events. I've sold physical products. I've, I sell digital products. I sell a lot of, of digital courses. I have a podcast that I don't monetize with ads because I don't like doing ads for other people. I only monetize it by selling my own products. How do I know that I don't want to monetize on my podcast by doing ads for other people? Because I didn't like doing ads for other people on Instagram. 
So I make money off of my Instagram by selling my own products, mostly digital products, because I get so bored of talking about the same physical product. Mm. I find it very boring. But how do I know this? Because, girl, I've been doing it for over a decade, <laughs> and I've tried yeah. all the different things. And most people just try one thing, and it either works or it doesn't work, and then that's what they do. But like I said, that's, that's also just like a privilege of my brand working out the way it did and my makeup and all, you know what I mean? Like all of the parts of me, I'm really good at branding. And then I like to shift around even the business model where I was a very events-based business model for a while and now I'm, this year I was supposed to be all keynote speaking monetization and then we shifted again because my dozen keynotes I had booked were all canceled. Right. Yeah. Okay, so. Did that help? Yes. Did I get there? Yes. Did we do it? We're there. Okay. We're Did there. Have we arrived? <laughs> <laughs> One of my very favorite podcast episodes from Awesome with Allison, I believe, is when you talk about not taking things personally. Will you talk about it? And mostly for selfish reasons. I want to hear you say it in person. But just talking about not taking things personally and how that shift affects your life in general and then also your business. Well, when you – I loved the, um, the feedback slide that you guys had for the website where you got just the feedback from people. And I saw just quickly one of the little comments said, this makes us feel small and blah, blah, blah. And my initial response after years of trying to train myself is that sounds like a personal problem. So I'm not going to be good <laughs> at website design for that reason and many other others. But um, this idea of not taking things personally – so how I first came across it, and this is part of that podcast series, is Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements, which is just, thank you for nodding. So um, yes, yes, if you, you like Don Miguel, I like Don Miguel. So um, <laughs> he is the best. So one of the four agreements is take nothing personally. Even if somebody walks up to you with a gun, shoots you in the head, it's not personal. And I take, took, so evolved, learning not to take everything personally which is why when I would throw a dance party for seven or eight hundred women I would and it was a wild success I would then go in my room and be riddled with anxiety because did I personally Allison make each of the seven eight hundred nine hundred women happy and I was talking to my friend, and she started laughing. And she's like, well, Allison, you know you can't control the feelings of 700 women. And I started crying because I was like, I really thought I could. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we do in our businesses. Um, sometimes we do it about our product. Sometimes we do it about the feedback from our team members or employees. Again, it depends on what your driving needs are. It depends on what your unprocessed wounds are. It depends on your life experience. It just depends on your unique makeup, how you're going to take things personally. Because I think some people might be listening and think, I don't take anything at work personally. But somebody uh, criticizes your driving or your sports team, and you are mad. <laughs> right? It just, we all, we all have our little sore spot. And so if you want to be wildly successful, you just don't take things as personally. Because one, you're going to be drained. And two, it's not about you. And three, oh, it just makes life so miserable. And you're not open to new ideas and solutions. So just, just think about the idea of when you're in that place where there are no solutions. And maybe some of you are there right now. And when you talk about a certain employee or you talk about a, a certain part of the website or you talk about a certain product or just some certain aspect, you watch the pattern, the habit, I slump, oh, no, that, whatever you respond, maybe not exactly like that, but whatever you respond like that to, you're in a place where, how are you going to find solutions in that place? Mm. And taking things personally, what does it mean about me? What, what am I making this mean? Um, what is, do I have no value if it's true? Is that really true? Let's say what they said, I'm a crap designer, I'm a crap coach. Let's say that's true. Do I not get to show up in the world? Like, what am I making it mean about me? What do I actually believe? See, it always goes back to what do you actually believe? What are your core principles? 
And then ugh, life is just so much better. And then every time you take something personally, it's just an invitation to just, where am I trying to hold on control? Where am I? So everybody wants to talk about authenticity, right? But like authenticity is behaving in a way where you're not trying to control how anyone perceives you. Mm. Really think about that. Like, like, cause business, that's why we lose all authenticity in business because you're trying to control how everyone perceives you because you want to manipulate them into a certain outcome. I don't know. We went a lot of places there. So do you feel like, places. do you feel like you got I, something yes, that you needed though? I feel great. I can talk I more great. on a thing. If you would like. No, no, no. Okay, no okay. We should wrap it. I feel like I've talked a long no, time. No, I want to talk okay. a little bit about influencer marketing really oh, okay, quickly okay. because I, uh, I've, I have heard on multiple occasions that there are many businesses who think influencer marketing is, In what sense? A lot is dead. In what sense is influencer marketing dead? In what sense? <laughs> give me a specific example. I really want to know. I can't give you one. These are things I've heard. From who? Entrepreneurs, business owners. Here's the thing. Everybody's mad at the influencers. You're so <laughs> mad at the influencers because they're, uh, listen, because I get it, because I'm one and I'm not one. I don't know how to work with you. I email you and you don't get back to me. You're not a business. You're a billboard. Oh, I hate that I need you. I hate that I need you. This, like, this is, it's, that's it. Influencer marketing is just our present term for collaborations. Mm -hmm. Collaborations yield growth. So I just did a cookie of the month was so delicious. Which was delicious. Thank you. It was delicious. I didn't want to say it if I wasn't allowed to say it. It was the most successful cookie of the month that they've ever had. I take, like, what credit can I take for that? Their baker is amazing. And I just was like, yeah, add more marshmallow. I mean, that's like, <laughs> I take no credit. Um, but I had so many people who don't want to spend three, four hundred, a thousand dollars on any of my programs and products, or even buy my journal, my I'm doing awesome journal, like a twenty dollar product. But they really do want to have a touch point with me, so they, they go and buy a cookie. So now I'm in 23 locations, and there's pictures of me with a cookie saying your fireside, your fireside fantasies, and they're like, who's the girl with the cookie? And then my audience, my people, have this incredible way to say, Allison, so I'm going to my gym. My kids love your cookie. My neighbor, I got your cookie. My trainer guiltily telling me I had two cookies over the weekend. And I'm like, Jared, eat more cookies. And so it gave this incredible touch point for growth, for relevance, for being top of mind. If you want to talk about brand, that's when people are like, how do I make my brand stronger? I think also what they're saying is, how do I get anybody to care? How do I get anybody to care? Collaborations, AKA, AKA influencer marketing, they're just collaborations. But everybody's mad about them because they're confusing. I have courses on them. I've done tons of teaching, coaching, training. Um, just good principles of collaborations. And it's not like influencer marketing is new. I wanna be like Mike. I wanna be like Michael Jordan anyway. Yes. So that's my response to that. Brilliant. Okay, thank you. I do want to open it up for audience questions so that we have enough time to get to everyone. Okay, great. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. We will run a mic to you. The mic will be held in front of you, and then we will go from there. Seth wants to talk about his logo. <laughs> that wasn't my logo. That was AJ, actually. But so did you, like, do you feel like the logo represented you? Did you identify with the logo? I am a really boring person. That's <laughs> what my question is about, okay? I look at this and I'm like, this works really well for likable people, but how do unlikable people build a successful brand? You, this is like the best thing I've ever heard in my entire life. So Seth said, how do unlikable people build a successful brand? The good news is that there's a lot of other unlikable people on this earth, and they're all going to hang out together. Seth, you were not an unlikable person. I loved you from the moment I saw Seth Says, right? So I think, I just don't think anybody's boring. I think people have decided they're boring. People have decided that what they geek out about is boring, but it's not boring. And so I work with a, I just worked with a biomimetic dentistry company. 
like what? How are they supposed to have personality with biomimetic? Like what is biomimetic dentistry? I'm just impressed that I can say it. And so the idea is there are real pieces of you. You're a real human. I have faith and confidence in all human beings. I really do. I really believe we're all part of one greatness. And so I believe that you take those things that fuel you and you put them in there. So let's say it's something, what do you think is boring? Like, or not interesting? Yeah, like, what, what about you is boring? You just said, I am a boring person. So part of Seth is self-deprecating humor. Does anyone know Seth? Is this accurate? Yeah. You guys, I'm also, like, kind of psychic. You didn't know, but now you do. So <laughs> Seth does self-deprecating humor. Tell me a little bit more about Seth. I do spreadsheets. He loves spreadsheets. Okay, what would you say, like, a spreadsheet is as good as? Um, for, for me? Yeah. Man, that's like, that's like a day on the beach for me. Like getting oh lost gosh. in a spreadsheet. It's, okay. It's it, just, just the, getting the, the concepts right and making sure everything is working right. It's, it's like this, this happy place where I can just bask in the glow of something that I did that does something correctly. I can't. Okay, so <laughs> Seth says, Seth, I knew we were best friends. Self, we know about Seth, self-deprecating humor. And spread a good spreadsheet is better than a good day at the beach. I'm sorry, is that not like a ridiculously strong brand? So how do you show up? How do you show up? Let's say you want to attract people to your spreadsheet skills. Let's just use that for an example, right? So, or even your web design. Yes, your web design skills. If you also believe that a good spreadsheet is better than your best day at the beach, this is for you. And if you always have a sock tan at the beach, like I do, then this is for you. See, there's the self-deprecating humor. Is that boring? No. I mean, you can say no if you think it's boring. That is a strong brand. You are going to attract people with your similar values, people who say, we are people like this, and we do things like that. So we purchase from you because you believe what I believe. So I just don't think anyone's boring. I think that we think we're boring. I think that as entrepreneurs, we believe we have to be charismatic. Steve Jobs is boring, isn't he? He's so boring. It's like the black turtlenecks. He's so boring. He's just really smart. And what does Apple think different? Ooh, I'm so different, right? But he's not like me different, like neon different. That's why people don't trust the package, but the message is secure. Any other questions? <laughs> I just wanted to say, I have been with Allison for over 10 years. And love you. I love you. And she speaks and talks her walk. And she, I've been to her events and her dance parties and all the things she just said. And she's one of the most authentic people. But it's been amazing to watch this transition because I guess in going to like those dance parties and things, she's worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. And so probably hearing their stories and hearing what they're suffering with and hearing, and then you have this authentic personality. It's like, well, as a consumer, I would buy this because, or I would buy your product because. And so she's looking at it from an, a completely different angle. And one thing I love about Allison's message is we don't need to service every person on the planet. Like, dial it in. It's okay. If some people don't like dancing, then they're not our customer. If some people don't like printing their pictures, then they're not my customer. That's totally fine. And we don't need to take it personally, but just dialing it in um, and connecting with them like she's explaining, I think is amazing. Thank you for being here. That was so nice of you. Thank you so much. I love, love you. Um, and congratulations on all your amazing success. Um, but I love what Shari is saying because it's like trying to boil the ocean. Right? And that's what so many of us do is... I need everybody, everybody has to love me, everybody's my customer, all of my ideas, all of my ideas, um, and then you're for nobody. Literally, by definition, if you're for everybody, then you're for nobody as well, right? Yes, AJ. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I forgot about the microphone again. <laughs> Allison, fantastic, so fun. To you're to so you. fantastic, oh, thank you so much. It's great. Thanks for having me. So. Think about your career, right? What do you feel or what would you say have been your defining moment, like the moment that Allison K 
came into existence, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how to answer that. In what sense? Like, when did I personally feel successful? When did other people take me seriously? Um, when did I get... I have maybe one answer, but I want to hear your When response. did you find your group? Let's, let's put it in that context. Um... <laughs> I found my groove and then like six months later was on a run and got hit by a car. That's a true story. Had to be taken by ambulance. It's almost two and a half years later, just fully healed. So it's like what you think is your groove. Is it your groove? I think I hit, I think I hit my groove honestly when I stopped doing the dance parties because I was doing them because I was so good at them and they were so much external validation and they were so showy and, oh, see, everyone could see the success. Um, they were no longer bringing me joy. They were no, I, will def I had a dance party planned. It got canceled by COVID. I had a dance party planned. Like, I love a dance party. But I think I hit my groove when I stopped saying, I just will let everyone around me take what they want from me um, and stopped and said, here's what I have to give. I believe in it. And this is what I will give with appropriate boundaries. And my audience changed. So this is, it sounds silly, but my dance parties were very much like I was a character at Disneyland where like, my photographer got a bloody nose from someone elbowing her trying to get to me to get a photo with me. I'm not a Kardashian. I'm just a girl who does nonsense dancing on the internet, right? But that was, but I think that kind of take energy was me saying, oh my gosh, whatever you guys want. Yes, here, let's just do it. Whatever you want. I'm just so happy you like me. Even though I'm this wildly confident person, I also am like, oh, this is what you guys want. I'll do it. So I think when I hit my groove, as I said, no more dance parties. I want to do a podcast. I'm going to talk about branding. I'm going to figure out my life. I'm going to stop having anxiety attacks. I'm going to work on getting a book deal and working towards a book someday. Um, and now I have a podcast. Nobody asked me to start it. And it has over 4 million downloads. And it wasn't until like a year ago people stopped. People still, somebody last night posted a picture of a dance party and said, when's the next dance party? Um, and we build our businesses that way. If I had just kept doing dance parties, let's think about this. If I had just kept only doing dance parties, what would I have done when the pandemic hit? Mm. That's a fun business model to figure out right now. But then it would have been what it was meant to be. It wasn't what I was meant to be doing. So I found my groove when I started doing what I wanted to do. Overnight, I stopped doing every single thing that brought me revenue, and I am the primary income provider for our family. So I also just do things like that, and I think that's just like a personality thing, it, right? Like it feels more stressful to have a set paycheck to me, so <laughs> <laughs> that makes me panic. <laughs> Thank you. Any other? No, we're good on time. What do you? What's your? What's your vibe? What's your flow? <laughs> yeah. What would you say is your biggest failure, and how has that molded you into who you are right now? Mm, there's like internal failures right? And then there's like external failures. And the best thing about failure is oh, you just get more resilient. And so I finally had this epiphany that if I wanted to do, I'll say this is a failure, but it's going to sound like a weird failure and then I'll tell you a real failure, okay? So I want to speak. I like a big stage. I like doing keynotes. Um, so much anxiety before and after that I mean, like, I couldn't interact with my children. I couldn't be with my family, but I want to do this thing. Um, and allowing myself to sit after the dance parties, after the keynotes, for weeks and weeks of anxiety, um, for going for six months, having an anxiety attack every single day, a full panic attack every day for six months, that is my biggest failure, actually. And not going and getting help and pausing what I was doing. That's my biggest failure. I also one time spent, like, 50 grand on a whole site of, like, party downloads and then just like launched it. And by the time it was like gonna launch, I was like, this is boring. And then I didn't sell any ever. So I, that's like a failure, right? But like, now I know I don't wanna sell those. So sometimes you just spend a lot of money and take a lot of pictures you don't use. So there's those different types of failures, but I honestly think my biggest failure 
was not allowing myself to get help and just, right, like just keep going. And then the breaking point was like, I'm not going to live my life this way anymore. It doesn't matter how successful I am or whatever. So, yes, thank you. You're wonderful. Allison, thanks. I love what you're teaching us. And uh, branding is so important, not just in business, but in, in personal lives as well. Yes. And, and I love this interaction here, too. Um, when you think uh, about being both a mom and a businesswoman and, uh, and teaching your kids about brand, how do, you, how do you help them discover what is core in themselves in their brand? I love that because I will take my entire branding workshop and just make it a purpose workshop because that's really what it is. Um, and so with my kids, um, I think what I try to do, so I have a nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a four-year-old. What I try to do is just reflect back their strengths to them. And what that requires is me letting go of expectations, judgment, ego, my own personal problems with myself. Um, because when we let go of those, we can reflect back to the people around us just their, their true core greatness. And so my nine-year-old, at the age of four, said, I don't want to be in pictures. So she's not in pictures. And we're watching the Taylor Swift documentary, and I'm like, don't you just want to be on the stage? And she's like, no. No. And so I think my only job is, like with Seth, to be like, that is not boring that you like spreadsheets. That is awesome. The world needs spreadsheets. Oh, my gosh. Do you know how many people are going to die because you're so good at spreadsheets or you're so good at, she's so good at, like, funny accents, like, whatever it is, right? So... I think it's um, just building that trust and that confidence in what they're inherently um, drawn to because I have found the most success in products and launches and courses and everything when I lean into that rather than, you know, trying to like do a Ven do like the four squares of like what the market needs exactly. If you're good at stuff like that, you should do it. I'm not good at stuff like that. Right? So just helping them see what they're awesome at and that it's, no matter what it is, it's, it's an incredible thing. Wonderful, thank you. I had to ask, uh, see, see if she could write it down <laughs> for me, but um, what do you think is the best way to um, go about reaching out influencers for collaborative marketing? So. I know there's so much that we can talk about it, but like, I, I'm having trouble connecting with them because we don't know them before. What is it that you do? Um, I make logos. Okay, so you make logos. Mm -hmm. So you want to reach out to influencers. So my number one tip for you is you, the best thing you could do is possibly meet them in person, which sounds counterintuitive because you're a designer, right? But influencer marketing, like I said, is relationships. And so it's, um, so that, that's like when you can go to conferences, you can't go to conferences. So honestly, what I would say right now is in order to be successful in new areas, you always like have to check your ego and come back to the starting place. So regardless where you are in your career, um, maybe charging tens of thousands of dollars for design, you might go to an influencer or someone with an audience and say, here's what I do. Here's the value of it. I will do it in exchange for promotion. And then you're like, how is it going to be worth it? It might not be worth it. But buying the billboard might not be worth it, right? And so how do you find an influencer that's good to work with? Um, it's, it's the same slide. It's this idea of who are you as a designer? What do you believe when designing um, a logo? And then finding people who you feel like reflect that. And then also for me, people reach out to me in direct messages all the time. I don't treat that as like a viable business exchange usually. Now, a lot of people, especially if they're under 25, do. I don't. You've got to go through my email channels. And so you're probably also just going to have to reach out to a lot of people. But just like any other business relationship, like you probably kind of know somebody. Do you already maybe know someone who has kind of a platform? Yeah, you just start with them. It's, it's nothing trickier. There's no, like, magic button. Stroke our egos. Actually know our content. Just like anybody else, you know? Yeah. 
I hope that helps. Good. Brilliant. Okay, so for the last question, this oh is goodness. what we always ask. It's our tradition question. What is something fun that your success has allowed you to do? What is something fun that my success has allowed me to do? I don't know how to say this other than I just, I love my life. Mm. I love my kids. I love my husband. I love the work I do. I love getting to talk to you. I love knowing that Brie has like some cool project ideas and that I could share something with her that could help her. I also really, really love that I've been able to create online and digital products. So I, when I'm not mentally and emotionally in a place where I can do that coaching, I can go and take care of myself. I love getting to talk on stages. I love getting to do a podcast. I love that I have an idea. And there are people who listen. What? Why? I feel all the time like I tricked people and all the time like everybody else should listen to me simultaneously. <laughs> so that's, to me, my success hasn't enabled me to do that. That is success. And I think my biggest success is that I feel well enough to feel it. Mm. So that is what, I mean, that's my mission. That's my calling. That's what I wish for everyone because holy crap, can you imagine how much differently the political <laughs> conversations, the online conversations would go if, if people felt that way? Because we're all just hurt right now. We're hurt. And I definitely have crappy days. Yesterday was a hard day. Julie and I are like, I can't believe we have to like not be in pajamas today. Yesterday was such a crappy day. You know, like I sat in front of my husband yesterday saying, I can see no good. There is no good. Like, and I meant it. He's like, you're in a dark place. But I have the, the tools and the practices and just whatever that we've worked on the last little bit, right? Like in my life, what I teach. Um, I hung out for about an hour and then I went home and I was able to actually enjoy my children. So uh, to me, that's success. And I'm really, really lucky. And it's, it is a privilege. And I see that as a responsibility to share and enable as many as I can. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for being here. Give it up one more time for thank Allison. Thank you, guys.